Good morning. I really don't know if this is going to be a good morning or not. Um, we're talking about, um, if I get this, talking about making sense of submission. And my dear best friend in the whole world, who's the senior pastor here, stuck me with women submit to your husbands. Now, I got a little problem with the He's supposed to be the quarterback. I got the ball and the tough one. Then he asked me to come back in two weeks and do what? Slaves and masters. What is this? So I just want to take a head count today just so I know which way to run. If you're a woman, please raise your hand. Okay, the majority of you over here, I'm heading that door out here when I get done. Okay, what I'm hoping is that the message that I bring today is encouraging and not oppressive and not demanding. Um, I I finally, last night about 11 o'clock, after studying a couple weeks, found a way to a way to make sense of this so that it becomes a, an encouragement to women. And Mike will then, because remember too, next week, you guys are on the hot seat today. We're up next week. I don't think he's a whole lot nicer to us. But there's a reason why. So let me just pray and then we'll get into it. Dear Father, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to share your word and knowing that your word does not come back void um, but blesses and encourages and strengthens us in this walk, in this, in this tense world, this broken place. But we're broken people and the only way we can get things done is through you, your love, your grace, and today particularly your Holy Spirit is what enables us to do what we have to do. So the passage, the, the series is called Making Sense of Submission. Can I submit to all of you a, a different title looking at the text? Um, looking at what we've been called to do, I want to submit this phrase, making known God's wisdom by how we walk in relationship. Making known God's wisdom for how we walk in relationship. Paul calls us in this book of Ephesians to live according, live according to the calling. Now, what I understand now is different than what I used to think. Live according to the calling I used to think had something to do with perfection sinlessness, deception, can't let people know I messed up. But what Paul's calling all of us to do is live according to the calling of authenticity, a commitment or understanding God's commitment to us, understanding that God's the change agent and he will transform us and understanding that he will grow in us a desire to serve others in love. And Paul's calling us to walk according to that calling. That calling. That we would stand before God honestly, authentically, holding both our love and praise and thankfulness for the Creator. At the same time, the tension that does and continues and will always exist because we our spirits trapped in a body that's about as selfish as you can get. And so, if we look at what Paul's trying to say, he goes back, and I'm going to read, and then I'll read the verse. He goes back, and I'm going to take you all the way back to verse 3, verse 3.10, and he says, 
God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which is accomplished in Jesus Christ our Lord. He calls us to think about manifesting God's wisdom. There's a couple different things that God calls us to do, but he challenges us to manifest God's wisdom. Submission then becomes one of the voluntary tactics of change. Submission isn't oppressive. He's not saying to men or women or to one another, I should love you. He's saying, I'm asking you with your liberty to love Greg. I'm choosing. Now, I don't really like Greg all that much. But I'm choosing, not because he's so lovable or dislovable, but out of reverence for Christ. Right? So we got to look at this notion. Paul asked us to look at, he's not only asked us to walk in Ephesians in the manifold wisdom of, of God, which means that there was junk going on in the church, right? Which means that people in Ephesians were called to liberty, and they must not have been using their liberty well. Now, they either was using their liberty to oppress people into say it well and do it well, but they were using their liberty cheaply, saying I can do whatever I want because I'm a free woman, a free kid, and a free slave now. So Paul's writing, and he says, I want you to walk according to that which glorifies God. I want you to walk. First, he talks about in unity, so there must have been some beef going on in the church. There must have been some fractions, some division. So Paul first calls the Ephesians to walk in unity. Generally, then he asked them to walk in truth. So there must have been some deception and hiding. Then he asked them to walk in holiness. And holiness is that notion that we've been chosen by God, and that in his eyes we're blameless. And in his eyes, the sacrifice, the, the work of Christ atones for the messiness of our life. Then he said, I want you to walk in love. And that word is agape. And it's, and all these things he's asking us to do, he's asking us to do, and we can't do it on our own. The Ephesians was like, oh, you know what, man? You're asking us to do stuff that ain't happening. Walk in truth. Walk in holiness. Then he says, walk in love. Agape. That now is getting real tough because agape means, Lyle, that I got to put my needs, I'm going to choose to put my needs not away, not self-denial. I'm going to choose to make my needs secondary because I'm listening to a brother who needs something. I'm going to choose to love and serve you. And in serving you, change happens. He's saying, walk in light. Terry, that means your job at the post office. Walk in light. That doesn't mean be perfect. That means walk in light of the truth of what you know. Be who you've been called to be. And be proud in that. Be free in that. Because light is attractive, but it also exposes. Light creates tension. See, the scriptures, I'm reading all these passages about marriage and, and all these Christian people thinking that, God created marriage for bliss. Terry and Tammy, you're supposed to be happy. And 
I'm not thinking that's what Paul's talking about. Do you, can you imagine? He's, first of all, calling believers to love one another, and then later on you'll see he's talking about, about how to walk as a family in front of the world. And, and, and my addendum is that I don't think marriage was intended to be a place devoid of conflict. I think marriage was actually to be a place like sandpaper, and we grind each other's rough edges off, and we box it out, and we and but we choose. The, the fighting is not, you know, my wife is a knucklehead and I'm perfect. The fighting is about learning to cherish one another in our role and our responsibility and our gifting, and putting ourselves down. See, in Ephesians, the coastal town. And, and they, multicultures, and it looks to me like they had three churches in the vicinity and they were a mixture of affluent and broke people. And so Paul's saying we need to walk in a way where there's some things disappear. Let's look at, in the ancient world, People were invested in chasing and indulging themselves. And in this particular time, men were the kingpin. And so men can make decisions about slaves. Men could say to Janice, this newborn kid has a freckle on her chin, put it out on the porch. And Janice would have to give up her kid. And nobody could say anything about it. Men could make a decision about one wife, six wives, and the wives were like cattle. They didn't have any value. They were just they were they were like they weren't worth teaching. And that's the frame. And even in the Christian church, in the early church, women were hated and held responsible for the sin thing. Even though the Bible holds man responsible. In the, in the ancient world, they were interested in money. Now, what I think about in terms of money, think about power and privilege. Power to conquer and take over places. And privilege, there was a significant gap between the haves and the have-nots. And the only people with privilege were men. And it depends on who conquered who, Greek men, Roman men, but whoever was the conqueror had the privilege. And lastly, pleasure. They were invested in pleasure, partying like it's crazy, orgies, all kinds of crazy stuff, just indulging in debauchery. And God's calling believers in that community to do something he says in chapter 4, right before we get to the submission section. He asks, trust the Holy Spirit. He's saying, Joel, you can't do it on your own, dude. You cannot do it on your own. The good you want to do, you won't be able to do. And the yucky stuff that your body wants to do, you will continue to do. Even with the Holy Spirit inside you. Even with a saving commitment to Christ. Walk in the calling of that. Understand that. But what he's saying is, trust the Holy Spirit to bring corporately unity. Unity isn't the absence of tension. Or unity isn't consensus, but it's the willingness to agree or to agree or disagree. It's the willingness to major on the majors and minor on the minor. He's asking you to trust the Holy Spirit will grow you in truth. There were Ephesians who couldn't talk about what they did in the dark. Now, that don't happen at hope, does it? 
that don't happen. That, you know, we, 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 we can come clean with it here, right? Not. But we're getting better. Come clean in the truth. And you know what? I think the truth isn't just your sin issue. I think the truth is coming to understand who we are in Christ and that the Father is committed to us and believe in the truth of that. The truth is he's committed to us and he understands our struggle and likes us anyway. Are you committed to that truth? Truth. Holiness. Everyone in this room has been called to a place where if you accept Christ, Christ has declared you clean and blameless. The Father says your sin has gone as far from the east as the east is from the west. Now, God's the only one that can do that. And some some, um, men in here would claim that women have a long memory. Some women would claim men have a long memory. The problem is we don't forget. We can forgive, but we don't forget. Then he calls us to walk in agape. And he calls us to walk in light. And he, then he calls us to walk in wisdom. Wisdom, I started to find out, is New Testament wisdom is the practical way we do this in the day-to-day relationship. Wisdom. So we're called to walk in wisdom. And, and walk in wisdom, I want you to think about this. Walk in wisdom means how best do I reflect what I'm learning? Walking wisdom isn't telling people what they need to know. So walking wisdom isn't to be gray-haired, flowing, glowing in the face, look like Moses, and people come to you and say, hey, man, I'm in trouble. Tell me what to do. So walking wisdom is to reflect, to be reflectors of the gospel, to be reflectors of the truth, to be reflectors of love, to dispense light. be doers of mercy, to be givers of grace, to forgive, to admit mistakes. And somehow, that wisdom is attractive. It brings teenagers to Christ in radical ways. It brings old folks to Christ in radical ways. It brings couples to together in radical ways. Calling us to love one another first. So the passage reads, the passage reads this way. And I'm just going to read the first verse. First verse says in in 21, before we get to the ladies, first verse is submit one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, what was going on was that before Christ came in the ancient community, before Christ came, women, children, and slaves were objects to be dominated and disregarded. Before Christ came. See, I was looking at it saying, okay, what are we going to do you know, I don't want it. My wife said to me, now here's in the love, my wife's, my, my wife's joking love. She leans over to me while I'm getting ready to go up. She said, don't mess up, dude. Because if you mess up, I'm out. That's her way of saying I love you. I said, thanks, honey. But what I know, she got my back. But in the ancient times, women, children, and slaves, Object at best to be dominated and controlled and disregarded. So make sure we're thinking about the context. 
So Paul goes around and he starts to bring the gospel to Asia and this Ephesian church and the Colossian church and the Philippian church comes about. And now after Christ, all the people in the rooms are valued. Work, baby. All the people in the room are valued. All the people in the room are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And all the people in the room begin to experience being regarded, cared for, loved, attended to. Not by some mysterious father. Not by some mysterious distant God. But by God who so loved the world that his son came to represent him rightly. And so the context is the church was a place of liberty. The Ephesian church was a place where in the ancient community, in the church, inside the church, women had a voice. Women were teaching. Women were prophesying. So submit is not a call to be quiet and sit in the back row and don't be in the teaching room. Women were walking around, hey, hey, hey. I got something to say, baby. And they were telling people things. And kids were cherished and not looked at as objects to either adorn me and make me look good or have sex with or whatever. Because the belief was that children were little, little adults. You could do whatever you want with them. And the slaves were treated with respect and honor. So that's the context. So what was wrong? I contend that in the Ephesian church, liberty was getting used wrong. It was getting used in a disorder. If you go further, 61 to 63 is when they think Paul wrote Ephesians. If you go to 63, 64 and look at Timothy, Timothy's in Ephesus again. And Paul writes a letter to him. And I think what happened was that the mix between the affluent and the poor was creating some havoc. And so what happened was Paul speaks toughly to women in two places, a couple places, but toughly in Timothy and Ephesians. But I don't think it's about shut up, don't think, let them walk on you, be, obey and let them step on you. I think what he was saying was, ladies, ladies, check it out. We have to walk according to the calling. Show them in the way in which you relate to people. That's what it's about. I've called you to think, to talk, to prophesy. I've gifted you to teach, to do whatever. So then we look at this notion. Now, we have to go backwards just one more time to think about the context in Galatians. Paul said it already. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's no race. Free or slave. There's no class. Male or female. There's no gender. So we're equal in this inner child. So Paul's saying, walk women. He's going to say it to men too. Walk wisely by submitting. And the, the picture of submission is to choose to trust. Or as, as my friend in, a, in a Ohio would say, Dennis McCallum would say, submission is a woman's decision to be responsive to her husband. To be responsive to the way he leads. Now, he should be leading, 
So it's really about being responsive to the way he's attempting to serve. Now, the Ephesian women were, what? No, I don't think they were. I would think there was, a, oh, yeah. See, in, the, in, the, in our freedom, sometimes when we, the chains come off, I indulge my liberty. And there's a place to come to an understanding of etiquette. I was at work on Friday, and there was a guy, there was a lady from Affleck, she was giving us a spiel. She was standing in the doorway, and my friend Earl was back there standing in the doorway behind her. And this other one of my colleagues who's a goofball, she's doing her thing. And this dude named Larry who broke his foot comes in, and there's a chair right here. He walks right in front of her while she's talking and sits down. And I'm in staffing, I'm scratching my head, doing like this. No, Larry, what are you doing, I asked him. He said, well, she liked my foot. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you walk right in front of her. There's an etiquette. There's a way in which we give attraction. There's a love. There's a way in which we deal with conflicted situations. See, I don't think that this was about, bring, this wasn't about, this, this is the perfect way to bring about peace. What he's saying is in a ma- relationship, people are watching. And conflict isn't bad. But ladies, your job is to be responsive to your husband's lead. And when you catch yourself not, the Holy Spirit will help you be responsive. Now, he wasn't even saying you should. He was saying voluntarily agree that that's what you want to do. And the Holy Spirit will make that happen. Now, here's the problem. Some of us as men, we ain't leading from a servant's perspective. It's not servant leadership. Servant leadership is serving from underneath. Because we, who falls too? Women want their way, want to keep what they have and get what they want. And men want to keep, get what they have and keep what they want too. And it seems to me in the garden, the, 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 the curse is set. There's a thing that God said men will want that it won't be good. They will lust after. And there's a thing that men will want that won't be good. So in Ephesians, they were having marital difficulties. Now, we, we don't have marital difficulties here. We in 2012, right? The truth is inside the church, marriages are dying faster than outside the church. The truth is inside the church. Marriages are dying faster than outside the church. So today, I'm saying, Paul's calling women to be responsive to their husband's attempt. Attempt. Do you hear what I said? Now, I did say, ladies, attempt. But I know we knuckleheads. To serve. Now, how do you do that? Back it up. First way we do that is to build love. Now, I wrote down here, build love. There's a verse written for children, because I know how some ladies think about their husbands. How many of you now, I'm not going to even look, but I want you to raise your hand. How many of you have husbands that you said to yourself, it's like having another kid in the house? Right? So there's a verse that says, chain a child in the way he should go, and when he grows up, he won't depart from it. I'm applying that wrongly, Mike, but I'm applying it to us. Okay? One of the ways in which women are wired to be responsive is to build love, to build the ability to train, to, to come alongside your husband in a way he should go. That's the hard part. Not the way you think he should go. I, did, I don't want to get lit, so I'm saying it quietly. 
Not the way you think he should go. In the way he's wired to go. Who is that man you're married to? Do you know him? Do you know what he's passionate about? Do you know what he's not so passionate about? Do you know what annoys him? It's not, it's not worshiping your husband. It's Paul saying, walk according to the calling. And it's hard to do. Because frankly, some of you are like, I want to get to know him right now today. And that's just the way it is. Also, two other ways you can do it. You can share fondness and affection. See, here's the interesting thing about the way men are wired. Men are wired in such a way that respect comes through hearing, hey, I really like the way you did that. I always like it when you, that was cool when you said that to me. When there's an expression of, I know when I look in my wife's eyes, she's fond of me. And I know when I look in my wife's eyes, there's affection. Bill, that's me. And thirdly, in a conflict, and all of us need to practice this, when it gets tense, because it's going to get tense, turn towards your husband as soon as you can. Turn towards your husband. Now, here's what I'm going to say to you. Don't turn and smile. <laughs> okay, I'm supposed to turn towards you. And he's going to get along good. Because God, God looking down at that going, nah, that's not what I mean. If you're mad, turn towards a mad, but turn towards him. So that we can begin the conversation again. Couples are blowing up because we spend a lot of time turning away, and turning away leads to contempt, and contempt leads to stonewalling, which means you don't talk anymore. And there's frozen time. And there's couples that have not had good conversation for years. So then you go, okay, I want to make this work, and it's awkward. And there are other couples who've had junk happen in previous relationships, so turning towards your partner. He's too quiet. He's too loud. She's too soft. She's too opinionated. And then figure this out. Turn towards him. Instead, there's some research out there that says instead of criticizing, being defensive, and growing contempt. Let me just break that down. Criticism is different than complaining. Criticism is different than complaining. I can lodge a complaint with lie. I'll say, hey, man, I, 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 have a, I had a hard time dealing with the way you ref that game. That's a complaint. The difference is criticism presumes there's a character defect wrong with lie. So I could come at him and say, dude, how could you make that call? How could you be so stupid? Now, that's a criticism. And a criticism presumes my character's in question. Criticism presumes a lack of trust. Criticism presumes distance. I don't want anything to do with you. Now, what happens is that women aren't the only ones that do that. So if a man is critical, then a woman's going to be defensive, which is the second piece. And defensiveness says the same thing back. You don't know what you're talking about. Lisa, you don't know what you're talking about. And you accuse me of something? Whatever. And as soon as I do that, I'm calling your character into question because how could you accuse me? Right? So now we got this cycle of criticism, defense, criticism, defense. And that turns into, over time, turns into contempt. Everybody do this for me. Do that for me. Don't look at me. Do it with me. I only see about half of you because some of you think it's stupid, Jay. It's really stupid. But the look of contempt means my left and my right, using my left lip, 
corner of my lip goes up. Yeah, you got it loud. There you go. You must do that. You do that a lot at home, man. Okay? So, contempt is disgust. Contempt is antipathy. Contempt at its worst is disregard. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with you. Another look of contempt. And you ever seen your wives do this, man? Now, what you don't know, women, that's contempt. That isn't just, I'm so tired of this. It is that too, but when you do up, up to the right, left, and roll your eyes and tip your head, you know, that thing. Yeah. It communicates to your partner. Not just you, you don't like what I did. You don't want anything to do with me. So Paul's calling us to build love, to share fondness, and to turn towards instead of contempt, defensiveness, and growing contempt. I finish with this. What's the purpose? Paul is saying, women walk wisely by submitting for the purpose of reflecting the wisdom of God communicated through us by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's the best way. Those looky-loos who are looking and saying, is that Jesus stuff for real? Watch how we handle the ugly times. And we, it isn't we better handle them well. Do we just, do we fight? Do we bang through it? And it reflects in each of us. It, it's also a challenge. Conflict's going to happen. The Holy Spirit sometimes is the author of conflict. Did you hear what I said? So you read the marriage books and they say, well, you do X, Y, and Z right. No conflict, throw the book away. Throw the book away. The masters of marriage fight like cats and dogs. But they finish well. They turn towards. They build fondness. They build love. They have, they have, they have a good friendship. And the first thing Paul's saying, and it's not first better than second or first because it's worse. The first group in the twosome he addresses is women to men for the purpose of allowing the Holy Spirit to transform you. He's asking, choose it, and the Holy Spirit will do it. Choose it, and the Holy Spirit will do it. Amen? Now, as soon as we get done with the praise song, I'm running out of here. All right? I want to call Tracy and Joel up, and then we'll do one more song, and then I'll pray, and then I'll have an announcement to make as well. Let me pray. Dear Father, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what you bring, and thank you for allowing us to have tension and allowing us a way to work the tension out. Um, thank you for also encouraging us in the faith. We've been called to be people that you've deposited your Holy Spirit in. In the face of ugly tension, you promise that you're committed to us and that somehow, some way, you will move us through. Be with us and all our families as we walk out today. These things we pray in Jesus' name.